I don't know. So that's okay. why you're here today. I'm going back and forth, Rabbi. Okay. <clears throat> We're learning Tanya. We're up to chapter seven for those of you who just arrived today. <clears throat> seven is about avoidus habiruring. This is the central work of a Jewish person, normal Jewish person in his life, which is separating out good things from bad. And to give you an image for it, it's like being a spiritual explorer. We're, we're staking claim for king and country. Our king is Hashem. And every time we do a mitzvah, we're saying, this Hashem is yours. And I say, brach on it, I claim it for you. Now, you already made it, but it wasn't acknowledged in the world. When I make a blessing on it, it's acknowledged in the world. Or, to put it in, in, in uh, spiritual terms, it redeems the blessing you make on it, redeems the spark of holiness that's in it, which is just a neutral nature ground, natural in its natural materialistic state. But by making a blessing on it, you elevate... The, the life that's in it, and then you do some a good deed with it, with that energy you get from it. So the the natural thing, the apple, or the sandwich, or the yogurt, or the banana, becomes included in a mitzvah which could never do by itself. But becoming by becoming your flesh and blood, <clears throat> it becomes part of the mitzvah that you do and the Torah that you learn. And the holiness that you draw down upon yourself, which is called the Shechina. When the Shechina means the dwelling place of God. Hashem wants a dwelling place in this world. Well, objectively, that's the holy temple. And the temple is destroyed. So that means all the shuls and places of learning where Torah is learned. They become a dwelling place for God. Hashem says, make me a dwelling place. We're going to learn this next week in the Torah. So that I should dwell amongst them. It says, <clears throat> the sages say, <clears throat> why does it say amongst them? And the Friedrich Rebbe quotes this in the first paragraph of Basilagani of his last ultimate mimer. He quotes the sages and say, why does it say amongst them? To say amongst it, I want to dwell in it. And the sages answer because Hashem means amongst them, amongst each and every one of them. And every single he wants. Hashem wants every single Jew should be a walking, talking base of Midrash. A place where Hashem's holiness dwells and be, can be seen in action. And people do see this. When you behave the way a Jewish young lady should behave, it makes an impact in the world. <clears throat> and, and people see godliness going around and it affects them. And it makes them shape up a little bit more than they already are. It makes them think twice about doing something selfish and encourages them, gives them a, an inspiration to do something good. <clears throat> so that's called avoidus habiruri, separating out the, the good from the bad, incorporating the good in your good activities, which is guided by the Torah, the 613 mitzvahs of the Torah, and that makes the whole world into a dwelling place for God. The, the idea of a dwelling place for God is called Shechina, the place where Hashem dwells. Oh, the Shechina is with him, or this is a place where the Shechina dwells. Okay, that's what this chapter is all about. <clears throat> and now we have some people came into the classroom to mark, mark the prisoners. Tova? Hello. Tova Myers, hi. And this is Bracha Simcha. Good morning. And, and, is this Sammy? Yes. And Liba. Getting there, Liba. Getting there. Liba Rivka. Yeah, I'll write it on the board. Amazing? Okay. 
you think that's amazing, just you wait. The best is still to come. Okay, it's called avoda. Avoda means the service of God. Avoda means, it means work. What's your avoda in life? What's your work? It is called avoda or avoidat or avodas, right? Depending if you want to speak Ivrit or you want to speak Ashkenaz. Avoidas, ha means the. Birur means separating out good from bad. It's one of the thing, labor, 39 labors on Shabbos that we do not do. Abirurim is Loshan Rabim. That means the service of separating or extracting, let's put it that way, extracting. Good from bad. <clears throat> so on Shabbos, we're not supposed to do birur. It's birur is a major kind of creative activity. We're not allowed to do it. So what do I do? I remember <clears throat> if you have good filter fish. It's made from fresh fish. You have bones, what are you going to do? You're not allowed to take the bones out of the fish. That's taking the bad from the good. You have to take the fish away from the bones. That's taking the good away from the bad, leaving the bad behind. To take, to, uh, take out the bad, that's birur. That's forbidden on Shabbos. But you're allowed to take the food away from that which you don't want and leave behind the pasalus. So in general, using things from the world <clears throat> to serve God, that is to do mitzvahs with them, is called avoidus habirurim, and that's, or, or, or in simple terms, that, that means refining the world. To refine the world. What is refining? Let's say you have a mine, a gold mine. So you have these big cranes with huge scoops, enormous scoops, and they scoop up huge chunks of the earth. And then that has to be sorted out. The, the, the mud and stones <clears throat> and the gold, you want to extract the gold from it. How do they do it? They do that in a smelting pot. They heat it up and the snow, the, the, the earth falls, the stones melt, and the gold runs off like liquid. That's called smelting. That's birurim. That's what birurim is all about. So we're turning the world into a, a holy, beautiful temple for Hashem, in which everything is good. N namely, our good deeds. They're good. Where does the, the world get its light from? before the mitzvah is done upon it, from a level of life that is neither good nor bad, since it is not good, the thing is not good, it's not good, right? We don't want to call it bad. It's not evil, it's not good. It's like your banana peel. Not good for you to eat. Your orange peel, you peel the orange first, right? And you throw it right. So there's a level of life symbolized by the idea of peels so the natural world gets its life from a level of godliness called the peels. P-E-E-L-S, peels. <clears throat> but then there are peels that you don't want to have anything to do with, like when you eat peanuts, you throw away the shell. But the inner shell you could eat. So there's good peels, there's not good peels. So the not good peels, the Torah tells us, don't do them. That's called negative mitzvahs. The Torah is really warning you, saying, you can't, this is a substance you cannot use in your service of God. It could be physically pain, pain, poison, so it's going to hurt you, it's going to damage you, or damage somebody else, so you have to stay away from it. Or it could be spiritually poison. May not look like poison at all. Like in, in, in uh, like a cheeseburger. Looks good. 
Torah says, no, you're not allowed to have milk and meat together. Why not? That's a secret. It's uh, the Kabbalah speaks about it, that meat gets its source from one level and milk gets its source from a different level of godliness. Hashem doesn't want them to be combined. Since Hashem doesn't want it, automatically that means it's bad for us. And for someone who's not Jewish, it's, not, it's fine. They can enjoy it. But for us, it's not going to help you when you have to make a decision between right and wrong and you're confused. The cheeseburger is not going to help you make the right decision. It's going to help you make the wrong decision. Because it's going to make you think that there's no higher authority that you have to listen to. So that's in general what avoidance of Yerurim is all about. Now, who, who just came into class? What's your name, dear? Yeah. Oh, this is Leah? Yeah. What did you change? Your hairstyle. Yeah, maybe. That's it. Okay. <laughs> Leah Rappaport. Where'd your name go? Here you are. <coughs> and this is Chaim Anasha. Yeah. Chaim Anasha. To you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sophia. Did I mark you here? Oh, yeah, I know. Did I call your name? I think I did. <coughs> Sophia. No, I didn't mark here. I marked you down. Thank you. Okay, welcome. <coughs> this is Tanya 101. Our introduction to mysticism, to holiness. <coughs> <clears throat> to recognizing the holiness of our Jewish life. We're in chapter seven, and all the sevens are beloved. Okay, so this clipper, we learned at the beginning of this chapter, just by way of summary, that this clipper is called Noga. And if we look into medieval literature, Noga stands for <clears throat> the seventh level of the stars, I believe, maybe the fifth. I think it's called by different names in, in, in idol worship as the king, the king of all the gods. That's what the Greeks and the Romans refer to it as. Noga means to shine. It's a level of life. You see, the, the constellations all are conduits for different levels of life that come into this world. The, the, the level called Noga is a level of life. Anything that gets its life from the clipper. Clipper means appeal. That's a metaphor. It's a metaphor for a certain channel of life from God. Anything that gets its life from that channel, you know, like you, you plug in your device to the wall, anything that plugs into this clipper <clears throat> will be the source of things that you can do. You can usefully do them. Kosher food gets its life from the clipper called Noga, which means to shine because if you do a good deed with it, you bring out the light that's in it, that's hidden in it, and you make that apparent. Like you have a little bit of money, your mom and dad sent you some money because you're away from home, and you got 10 bucks, and you go to shul, and there's this lovely Russian lady sitting outside with blue eyes, and she sits there, <clears throat> and you give her a dollar, and she her face lights up, and she says, oh, thank you. You made her very happy, and that happiness shines, because you did a good deed. And that good deed is from Clippus Noga, and that dollar now became part, became elevated into the world of godliness and holiness so all the kosher food animals kosher animals you know how many kosher animals there are in the world <laughs> 10 like the 10 commandments sarah abigail is here 10 like the 10 commandments <laughs> however like we said last day <clears throat> 
only three of them are domestic. So if you want any other kosher animals, you have to go hunting. But sheep and goats and cows and tati cows, which are called bulls, they've been on the farm. <clears throat> Is poultry its own category? Kosher? No, like, like poultry. Chickens are... Chickens, yeah, chickens are fowl. So fowl are birds, bird life. Bird life, they're, they're, most birds are kosher. Therefore, the Torah lists 21 birds that are not kosher. Because that's the easiest way to do things. <clears throat> By listing these 21 birds that are not kosher, if you're, a certain bird is not one of these 21, you know it is kosher. <clears throat> How do you know if a bird's kosher or not kosher? You can usually tell by the, its friends. It's a lesson in life. They say, you know, common sayings of the people in the streets are also called Torah. Common truths, you know, like you ever heard this expression, a stitch in time saves nine. You know what that means? If you have a rip and you sew it up quick, then you don't have to, you don't get a bigger rip. A stitch in time saves nine later, right? These sayings, you know, early to bed, early to rise, <sighs> makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. That's Torah. It's not written in the Torah, but everybody knows it's true. And something that everybody knows is true is also Torah. Because anything that's true is Torah. Okay. <clears throat> so there are 21. No, oh, and so about how do we know about the friends of the birds? It says, <clears throat> excuse me, birds of a feather. Who can finish that sentence? Flock together. Flock together. No. Oh, you there you go. I would have not ever thought of that. So be careful who your friends are. <laughs> if you hang around with people who are, you know, not leaving, needing a good life, then that it speaks about you. If you hang around with people who are leading a good, productive, holy, positive life, that also speaks about you. Then you want to be with them. And 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 birds of a feather flock together. So birds that are kosher also get their life from this klippa called noga. <clears throat> and all of the deeds that we do that are not listed in the Torah as prohibited, as against the will and wishes of God, the, the life force that you get when you do that good deed is from klippa's noga. Or the life force that you get when you refrain from doing a bad deed. When the temptation is there to do something nasty and you don't do it, or maybe other people do do it, and you don't join that gang of bullies, <clears throat> you hold yourself back, even though it may look like they're having fun at someone else's expense, and you don't do it, the life that you're getting at that moment is from Clippers Noga, and it's elevated by your holding back. And the life that the bullies are getting is from impure clippers. And that's bad news. Because that's the source of life of everything that goes against God's will. There are four levels of clipper we learn in this chapter. Like there are four levels of the name of God. But this is the opposite image. This is the mirror image. The negative mirror image of holiness. Holiness has four levels corresponding to the four levels, four letters of the name of God. And the negative mirror image also has four levels. Three levels are totally impure. They're the source of all the bad deeds in the world. <clears throat> and they're the source of life of the souls of the bad people. And then there's the fourth level which is higher than them, just like the letter Yud is higher than the other letters of the name of God. Shem's name is Yud, K, Bob, K. The Yud is higher. So Klippus Noga corresponds to that 
in the realm of Klippa, and that's the source of all the deeds that we do that are permissible. The Torah encourages them. The Torah considers them mitzvahs, good deeds, commandments. As long as there's no connection with a transgression involved or a derivative of a <coughs> transgression, then it gets this gets its life from Clippus Noga. That's what Clippus Noga is all about. And that's what this chapter is all about, chapter seven. Let's turn to the, look at it inside. Everybody has a book. Are there more than four levels of Klippa? Uh, the Tanya doesn't speak about more than that, but, but, but everything else that we learn has levels within levels. Uh -huh. Like <clears throat> if there are 10 aspects of a person's soul, each of these aspects has 10 aspects. So the complete makeup of a person's soul could be 100. And if these are working through, these 10 aspects are working through the three garments of your soul, which are thought, speech, and deed, and you got all 100 in each of them. So now you get up to 300 and 3,000 and 30,000 and so on. There's levels within levels of everything. <coughs> So the, for whatever reason, Tanya and Hasidus doesn't really speak at length analyzing and describing the negative clippers anyway. We, we stay away from it. It's an interesting question you ask. And just in general, I'm not too familiar with this because my whole experience of Judaism has been through Chabad. <clears throat> and I didn't explore some people like to explore. I'll try this, I'll try that, I'll try all so many things, and then I'll see which one I want to go with. I never did that. I found about found out about Torah from Chabad, and I, I didn't deviate. I stayed with it. So some people they know they they you know they, they, they hop from one tish to the next, from Rebbe to Rebbe. And they know all about the different approaches to Judaism. Okay, so in general, there is a, another approach. The end of which is the same as Chabad. The, the approach, the goal of learning Hasidus and approaching Torah through the teachings of Hasidus is that we should have a close, warm, loving relationship with God and our service of God should be filled with enthusiasm and love of our fellow Jew and love of Torah and love of Hashem. That's what it's all about. There's a, a different approach <clears throat> which is also based on the teachings of the sages. Don't get me wrong, it's, it's holy. <clears throat> but it, it stresses more the dangers and pitfalls involved in our character. And it talks a lot about negativity in, the in one's character. So we'll be alert and warned to stay away from all these negative things. The approach of Hasidus avoids that. <clears throat> in general, the Rebbe is always looking at the positive in everybody and everything. And the approach of the Rebbe is to see how can he help each person achieve the utmost goodness in their life. And then automatically, the negative things get left behind. Whereas when you're concentrating on the negative in your character, trying to avoid it, sometimes you just get stuck there and you forget about the positive. So these are two different approaches. They're both holy. And the secondary approach, which I just described, is called Musar. Musar means sort of describing negative things. So one of the, the major themes of the Musar movement is to speak positive and not to say anything negative about somebody else because, because negative talk kills. It's, it's murder. You murder somebody by saying a bad thing about them. And once you hear something bad about somebody else, you can't forget it. And, and it damages them and continue keeps on damaging them as other people hear about it. And when you say something negative and it goes, and it goes out like that, then you can't take it back. And if you steal money, you can give it back. But if you malign somebody's reputation, it just keeps going. It can ruin a shidduch with a slight word. Everything's going fine. They're supposed to get married. 
and they have a reference down there and they don't know that this reference really doesn't like the girl. And she thinks it's just her best friend. And she gives her a half-hearted recommendation or an even not. A, oh, well, yeah, she has a nice girl. She's a, but you know, she was a Catholic that's with a lot of problems. Oh, okay, thank you for the information. And they dropped the shit in. How about in, in, in the work, in the works, but workplace? Person could lose his job. <clears throat> Or making assumptions. Sometimes people make assumptions, they make a mistake. <clears throat> and they assume that somebody else did something bad to them and really didn't happen. Just there was an oversight or, or person put some money into a, <clears throat> in a drawer and the money disappeared. And the only one who knew where the money, this is a famous story, you know, the, the, the wealthy Rothschild family, you know how they got started? <clears throat> What's his name? I forget his first name now. Rothschild, he's a nice young man. He was a secretary for our Rebbe. And the Rebbe had a drawer in which he kept all the money that was given to him to distribute to charity. And the money disappeared. And the only one who knew where it was was this young Rothschild fellow. And so the Rebbe dismissed him. But he didn't do it. And that was a very negative thing on his state, on his character. Until sometime later, <clears throat> what, what did he do? He went out, he worked, he earned the money, and he gave the Rebbe back the money that was missing. He gave the Rebbe back, he didn't take it. We want to clear his name. He gave the Rebbe back the money that he never took. <clears throat> and then the police discovered that the cleaning lady was spending money and they, they arrested her and she confessed that she had taken the money from the Rebbe's, the Rebbe's drawer. So now he was filled with remorse and he called the young man back. He took him back into his service as a secretary and he blessed him <clears throat> that he should be very, very successful. And that's how the Rothschild, that was the blessing that made the Rothschilds rich. That's how they got started. So and that's the power of the things that we say of speech. How do we get there? The things that we, okay, well, well we'll find our way back. <clears throat> Oh yeah, right. So yeah, the, one of the main themes of Musar is to be very, very careful never ever to say something bad about somebody else, even if it's true. Even if it's true. Don't let an evil word cross your lips. A negative word. You know, like the, the American song, Home on the Range? Yeah. Where never is heard a disparaging word. And the skies are not cloudy all day. Home, home on the range. <laughs> Where the deer and the antelope play. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's, 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 that's one of the main themes of the Muslim movement. Because here's a, here's a, and, and the, the Talmud itself testifies that negative talk, Lashon Hara, negative talk, gossip, slander kills three. It kills the person that it's about, but it kills you if you hear it because it affects you and it affects the person <clears throat> who says it, it contaminates them and it re retroactively, he heard it from someone. It contaminates the one, so it's really four. It kills the one who <clears throat> it's about, kills the one who says it, kills the one who he hears it, and kills one who invented it <clears throat> in the first place. So that's Musr. And Hasidus emphasizes the positive. Just emphasize the positive. Whereas 
what's called the Musr Shmuz, where the, the, the teacher will take you and analyze and analyze and analyze all the negative things involved in negative behavior. Talks, talks more about godliness. With the idea that a person will be inspired, he just won't go there. We don't want to go there. You know, they say, when a person goes into a bakery, you never go into a bakery, but you don't come out with flour on you. A person who wrestles with somebody who's all schmutzig, he, gets, he also gets dirty. So we don't want to talk so much about the dirtiness because there's something in our soul that is responding positive, responding to it, it's resonating in our soul better. We don't need the resonation. Let's just concentrate on good things, let our soul resonate there. That's the difference between these two movements. But both movements have the same end, <coughs> which is that a person should serve Hashem in holiness and purity. <clears throat> with all your heart, like it says, you shall love the Lord your God <clears throat> with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. I say those words every day in English. The Shema. I say the Shema in English as well as in, in my prayers. Right? Because they're such important words. You should teach these words diligently to your children. Impress upon them <clears throat> the meaning of these words. And speak about them when you're sitting at home, when you go out somewhere, when you lie down at night, when you get up in the morning, <clears throat> you should bind them for a sign upon your heart, hand over your heart and over your eyes, over your mind, and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates, such holy words, creating a holy environment out of your life and your home and your relationships. Okay, now, page 118. So we basically now this morning summarized, discussed this idea, oh, time is almost up. The doing good deeds, we elevate the world. We extract the holiness and goodness that's in everything, and it becomes included <clears throat> in the general world of holiness. That is, that, that's what Hashem wants. I came into my garden. Hashem created the world like a garden. We messed it up. We did not good things. We did things Hashem told us not to do. They ate from the fruit and Cain killed Abel. And Enosh worshipped the idols. And the, and the holiness of God said, I can't dwell. I can't, <clears throat> I can't be in such a place. You're pushing me away. And then came seven holy tzaddikim and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their wives, and they brought Hashem back level after level until the seventh was Moshe Rabbein, who brought Hashem back down to earth on Mount Sinai and gave us the, the directions how to restore the world to its pristine, garden-like state. <clears throat> and that's what we do with, with, with mitzvahs. On the other hand, page 118, on the other hand, <clears throat> okay, let's go. I'm going to go back a little bit further. Where he, page 170, he gives an example. In the middle of page 117, if a person eats and drinks with the idea that it's, he, he wants to fulfill a commandment. Oh, even before that, top of the page, 117, Rava, great, great, great teacher of the, in the Talmud. Rava means great. He, he was called great because he was so great. The whole Torah was, was in him, and in his mind, and on his lips, and in his behavior. And he said before he would judge a case, he would drink some wine and, and in, enjoy a good fragrance. Because it would broaden his mind, that he would be able to judge clearly. So he's eating and drinking in order to clarify what God wants from us. That's one example. Then he gives another example. <clears throat> that is, that is avoid a sabirudi. Okay. Haya. Yaira. Got it? That is an example of avoid a sabirudi. A person who eats meat. <clears throat> and there's a case given in the Talmud. My alarm is going to go off. Here we go. That says, hey, finish up. <clears throat> If you eat with this godly intention, 
Rava was uncertain about how a certain case should be judged. He went and had breakfast, and then he was able to figure it out. In, in, in other words, the sparks of holiness in the food gave him spiritual energy that he could distinguish the fine line between right and wrong. You understand? That is the effect of a way to subyurian. So when we lead a kosher life, it helps us to make the right decisions and not stumble and, and make a mistake. By accident, make the wrong decision. <clears throat> That's during the weekdays. On holidays, Shabbos and holidays, it's more automatic. The holiness of the, of the Sabbath or of the Yontav has an effect on everything we do. So the food automatically <clears throat> gets used for a good purpose on Shabbos or Yontav. So you have to really work hard to, to use food on Shabbos for a, a bad purpose. And I won't give you examples of how you could do that. You can think of your own. And the third example he, get, he says here in the middle of page 117, when one eats and drinks in this manner with a godly intention, that is to say we put a spin on it, that we're doing this in order to serve God, in order to learn better, in order to do mitzvahs better, then the energy, the vitality that's in the meat and that's in the, in the wine, because they are from the natural world, they are kosher, they're permissible, they get their life from the, the klippa called noga, only now they go up from Klippanoga into the out of Klippa into the world of holiness. I want to repeat that. That that when you do good deeds during the week or on Shabbos when you eat kosher food, drink kosher wine, and behave Shabbos dick in a Shabbos dick an appropriate manner for Shabbos, then the energy in the in the meat and the wine and the chicken soup and the gefilte fish, and the challah, and the singing, and the discussions, which all got its energy from the klippa called Noga. You extract from it, you reveal in it the shine, the light, and it goes up into the, the luminous world of godliness. <clears throat> and similarly, on page 117, concerning your speech, when you make a humorous remark, the teacher makes a humorous remark, and it so to speak, speak breaks the ice. Before class, everybody relaxes, and they, they hear better. They get the lesson. Ah, they relate to the teacher better. And the lesson is meaningful to them. So in that case, joking around can be holy. Nice. And smiling is almost always holy. When you smile at someone doing a good deed, or to say to them, good morning, have a nice day, that's a good deed too. Okay, have a great day, everybody. Thank you for coming. Those who are trying out the whole Yadus, I hope you'll enjoy it and come tomorrow, 8.30. Rabbi, you want to hear a cute story? What? You want to hear a cute story? Cute story? Yeah, sure. Today. What's a cute story? Okay, about? how you're saying that like just your presence can impact something. Huh? So how just like your presence can impact the people around you. So, you know, obviously it was just some boy around she was doing all of that. And we were in Walmart buying stuff for the program. And it was me and another girl, and we're going to leave. And the woman who checks her seat asked, like, if we were Christian, we're like, no, we're Orthodox. And then she said that she could just see that there was something about us and that we were glowing and just look angelic and then she asked us to pray for her <laughs> and it was just like these two prom girls walking around in skirts speaking of which I want to ask everybody here from the Kinnesa Shluchos my daughter came home <clears throat> from Kinnesa Shluchos there was a girl at her table who was weeping crying and crying they talked a lot about fertility and there's a whole video about it. And there was really, my daughter went over to her and said, why are you crying? I don't know you. I don't know anybody at this table, but why are you crying? So she says, I'm crying because I, 
She says, what do you want? She says, I really want a baby. I want to have a child. So my daughter said, well, I'm going to add, I'm going to say a prayer for you every day. You let me know when you have a child. So this is her name. Nahamaleya Bas Hana. So we're, we're going to praying that she should have a healthy Jewish child. Nahamaleya Bas Hana. Nahamaleya Bas Hana. 